Hi everyone, welcome to our uh, another uh, online meetup. Uh, the, today we are going to have Hi everyone, welcome to our another session. Sorry, there was some feedback here. So today we have another exciting session about uh, more practical, hands-on uh, uh, topics. We had last week uh, for the past few months we've been seeing some interesting perspectives and interesting tools like weight and bias and PyTorch Lightning. So feel free to check our previous uh, meetups as well. And I, we also have some pretty exciting news. Next week, there will be an in-person meetup in Saldanha. I'll leave the, the, the links to the meetup here below in the chat. And uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. If you feel like today's topic you are definitely super interested and you want to know more, please feel free to check up. There will be also some beer and pizza, so I was told, so yeah. Um, just as usual, let me just briefly introduce. So expect more or less 45 to one hour of talk today and then 10 to 15 minutes of question answering. You feel free to leave all the questions below in the chat. You don't have to wait until the end. This is, you can ask all the questions and in the end we will select some for George to give us his perspective. Um, yeah, so without further ado, let me introduce the speaker. George uh, Psoe is an engineer at Entropy. He's been working mostly in MLOps and, and um, his previous background was is in software engineer. He actually went to the same university as I did. And previous, uh, Previous to his current job position, he was uh, leading the engineering team in Django AI. So yeah, I guess he will tell us a lot of great things and interesting things and how we can basically transfer this uh, research in machine learning to facilitate uh, production, productionalization and make it easier for engineers to actually uh, deploy this product. So George, I've been talking for a long time now. <laughs> Feel free, the, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Katerina. Thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, also, thank you very much for the, um, the invitation to be here today. Uh, it really is a pleasure uh, to allow to be allowed to talk a bit about the MLOps world um, for people that are interested. And I hope I make uh, an interesting uh, talk for you guys. Feel free to, as Katerina said, to leave some questions. Thank you very much as well for, to you, Katerina, to Louise, and everyone in the deep learning sessions uh, for this opportunity. I hope uh, you all enjoy, and also thank you everyone that is uh, watching. So without further ado, let's get it started. Um, I was invited here to, to talk a bit about the MLOps world. So uh, let me start just by giving you a very quick overview of, the, um, of how the presentation is going to go, and then uh, let's get on to it. Um, to begin with, I'm just going to go very quickly through a motivation to explain why we actually need this MLOps world. Then I'll do my best uh, at doing a simple definition of MLOps so that you have in, you can understand what it is and where it should be applied. And then we'll talk through the different, let's say, core uh, pillars of MLOps or stages. And um, we'll finalize with a demo, uh, which I hope you can uh, tune in and, and uh, stay until the demo, because I'm hoping to get all the, the different principles that we're talking about and put them in practice uh, in front of you as much as possible. Uh, and also uh, give you an idea on how it actually materializes. Right. So let's get uh, let's begin then. Um, as a lot of <laughs> as a lot of you know, uh, lately uh, machine learning is like uh, the golden goose of, of companies. It's everyone can derive value from machine learning. Uh, small companies, big companies, old companies. There is a problem though. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these projects in machine learning uh, actually fail before getting to production. And they felt before getting to production for uh, several reasons. Usually, the complexity in, in, in taking a machine learning model uh, <clears throat> that is actually giving, good, giving you good results and delivering it to production is, com is really overlooked. Uh, companies do not understand the, the challenges there is in maintaining, especially like bigger companies that are not particularly tech focused and they just expect to be a breeze. Now walk in the park and then they're faced with, uh, with a lot of different challenges. Also, there's um, always a step between research and, and moving uh, models to, to production that requires a lot of work, right? 
And this is basically the area where MLOps is trying to act on. Uh, the objective is to help in the situations where we have a uh, certain model uh, challenges and we want to put it to production, but also to make the whole cycle of, develop, uh, of machine learning uh, easier and smoother process. Uh, and if you think about it, it's very easy to get a model in a notebook, follow a tutorial, do something from Kaggle, uh, but there's no magic button to, you know, to, to deploy the, the model in the notebook, deploy to production and monitor and all of that, right? And that's the magic button that we're trying to kind of automate with uh, MLOps. And I know that there's a lot of reasons for which um, MLO machine learning in itself is, <clears throat> is difficult to get to production. Uh, if you guys are working in the field of machine learning, I'm pretty sure you faced a lot of them already. Let me just enumerate a few. Uh, obviously, it's a hard and slow process to move something to production if it's a manual process, right? But if it's not a manual process, then you will be faced with other challenges. <clears throat> How are you tracking the development process? How are you ensuring that there's right collaboration between the different data scientists in the team? I mean, having a model that runs in your notebook and the weights that are stored in your computer, that's not properly good collaboration process. <clears throat> processes. And then how do you actually iterate quick, quickly in models, right? We've, we've developed some techniques to iterate quickly in software engineering and efficiently, but it's a bit of an unknown field or was until recently uh, for machine learning. <clears throat> and then other things like the environment, uh, tracking the model performance, debugging a model, checking out errors, all of these things are not considered the first uh, the first time that you actually think, okay, let's do a machine learning project and let's get this magical predictor to tell something about our customers that will derive a lot of value from. But these are the the, so the forgotten pitfalls. Um, yeah, and as a consequence, uh, at least in my perspective, uh, without without having MLOps uh, as a backing, uh, there's a lot of value that is lost from machine learning, especially because it. It is. <clears throat> it kind of loses usefulness as a dynamic tool, and by dynamic tool, I just I mean something that can adapt to business requirement changes, something that can be upgraded, improved um, in a very quick and efficient way. And without and that's a lot of the, the feel, a lot of the, the things that MLOps is trying to to address, right? So this is just is just trying to understand where this need comes from. And uh, hopefully, it's enough. Uh, to, to motivate you to, to continue watching. Uh, so let's start with uh, trying to now understand what it really is and isn't, and um, how wh what are the, the practices in particular that MLOps is trying to deal with. There's obviously <clears throat> always a disclaimer, and you might have noticed the, my poor attempt at the definition. Uh, it's actually because it's really difficult to define a field that is so young. And I'm, when I mean young, I mean like, 2017, 2018, where it actually started to get some relevance. And at the same time, it's very, very close to other fields like ML engineering, data engineering. And there are sometimes it's, uh, they're so close that there's literally no consensus where like one ends, one begins. And there's everyone has a different opinion. But to be honest, it doesn't really matter because what I really want to talk to you about is like practices that make machine learning op uh, operations and machine learning productionizing as smoother, easier, and better. And what you call it uh, in the end is not um, yeah, it's not that, that important, right? Um, so a good first step to to think about MLOps is actually to think about it like as the application of certain core principles from DevOps, you know, infrastructure and, and all of that, uh, and apply them to machine learning. But it's also a bit more than that because, to be honest you're not just going to transition smoothly from being simply an MLOps guy, a DevOps guy to be to work in MLOps. Uh, it actually involves more, a bit more knowledge, particularly so for some software engineering and from machine learning. And in the end, you kind of merge the, the three areas and that's where, where you get MLOps. But <clears throat> notwithstanding, there is a lot of value in looking at the, uh, some of the core principles of DevOps and seeing how we can apply them to machine learning to uh, derive more value from it. So, and, and uh, trust me, uh, this, this uh, part is uh, going to be a bit clearer, clearer in a second. Um, what is then those core principles that we're looking to, trans, uh, to transpose from uh, DevOps to um, machine learning? Well, first of all, is about reproducibility. Because if you're doing things in a notebook with a model, uh, and you're not tracking what requirements you have, you're not tracking anything, and in six months you try to run your model again and you try to get the same results, you're not going to be able to do it. It's not you've not 
focused on the reproducibility of the process. But this is only for training. There's also testing. There's also the reproducibility of the deployment uh, of a model to production. All of those processes being reproduci reproducible are very important to make machine learning auditable, to make machine learning debug debuggable, so to say, and to increase the ease at which different members collaborate, which goes to the next pillar, making machine learning collaborative. Obviously, uh, there are teams working in, in machine learning without any sort of special practices. However, it is important to understand that we're also trying to, to bring collaboration not only from a code perspective, from using Git, but also from an operations and process perspective. So uh, in, if, you have a train, if you have a deployed model, who trained that model? Who generated the data? Who generated the data set? All of this information is essential to have basically a, a model lineage that explains the whole process and makes the process, process trackable, makes the process uh, explainable, and also make, allows you to reproduce the, proce uh, reproduce the process uh, in the future to retrain the model. And um, all of this <coughs> is made easy to begin with if you focus exactly on accountability and allowing uh, your, uh, your team to work in parallel. And finally, uh, also a very big tenet of, of DevOps is continuously continuous verification, continuous integration, continuous deployment, as whatever you, you want to call it. And it's all about uh, having certain processes of quality assurance and of deployment and constantly running those processes. When I mean constantly is at every possible opportunity and every possible change, you're looking to, uh, you're looking to test your model. You're looking to test the results of your model, evaluate your model. And as, as easily as possible, deploy your model as well. Integrate your model with the rest of the system. Monitor what is happening. These continuous processes give you a freedom of working around in machine learning that, are not, that you do not have if uh, everything is disconnected. If you just have things in notebooks and you're not uh, con continuously checking if everything is OK, if everything is within expectation, if you do a big change or test a big new architecture, does everything still work? Those are the questions that we're trying to eliminate from the equation and make them basically automatically answered, right? So this is how you kind of take the, the these three core, core principles and shape them a bit into the, the world of machine learning. Um, and what can we, so thinking about this, what can we take as possible goals for machine learning, right? Um, and this should be the more uh, tractable things uh, that, so what are we looking to actually make the teams uh, feel, so to say, when using these types of practices? First and foremost, and those are these goals are very simple. We want to improve speed and we want to improve, improve ease of development. And the way that we do it, as you saw before, is by providing reproducible environments such as, such as code and data lineage. And when you do that, you're, in, you're allowing uh, teams to develop it, uh, faster and also through improved collaboration techniques. And you're also allowing your teams to work faster. Um, you're also looking to improve the speed and ease of deployment. And you do that through the continuous processes, automation and verification, and by ensuring that the quality of your model and the quality of your outputs and your predictions and your integration within the systems is also constant. And very closely tied to the last point, you want to ensure the quality and correctness of the model during the whole life cycle. And the life cycle means from data preparation to deployment, to monitoring, and all of the steps in between. And this, through ensuring the quality and correctness in a sort of automated manner, you are basically taking a lot of cognitive uh, burden out of your team and data scientists, which is very important to, for the other two points, uh, previous points. So let's, let's uh, think a bit about how so we, we, we saw what kind of principles we're trying to guide ourselves into. We saw what are the goals of what we want to do, right? But I've not yet uh, said anything in practice of how, we, uh, how do we apply these principles and goals in the actual process of doing a model. And we ensure that we improve the process towards the goals that we defined. Let's, if we start on a regular model life cycle, simplified actually model life cycle, we usually start with data preparation and we do some experiments, we do, and then eventually we do training of the final model that we want. Uh, this is the development stage, and then we do the deployment. We have a production model, and there's data feedback from incorrect results or from eventual something eventually changing that requires us to train again. So this is the normal lifecycle model. The only thing that I want to 
to what I want to see now is talk about a few core processes that we can introduce here in this normal cycle and <clears throat> improve the, the quality of, of the, the process, but also go towards the goals that we, we just presented. So here's a couple that for me are some of the most important and, each, and are the ones that I'll, I'll be talking about today. Um, the first one is tracking. And tracking goes a long way on the reproducibility and accountability collaboration. Tracking is about uh, understanding from the data to the models what, has, what, what happened, how the data was created, how the data sets were generated, how the models were run, with what parameters, in what hardware, in what environment. Tracking is about maintaining the, the, line, the lineage of a model from the moment it, 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 the, gen, the data is generated to the moment that the model is uh, phased out of production, for example. The second part that kind of affects the whole circle and the whole life cycle is the orchestration. And orchestration is, uh, goes a bit closer to DevOps than to machine learning. It's about providing the necessary infrastructure it's about providing the necessary tools for the whole team, the data scientists, to execute their tasks and their different stages without having to be concerned about these things, make things automatic and efficient. Uh, CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment, is all about um, the continuous processes that I described. So it's about are continuously testing your models, uh, continuously ensuring that the outputs are correct, and also continuously deploying models as soon as they are needed. So in an automated, automated, but also quick manner. And finally, the continuous monitoring part, which is when you have a model in production and, uh, <clears throat> and you're looking to understand what's going on in the model, there's a need to, be, to understand the outputs, the latency, all of these different metrics that tell us the health, so to say, of the model and basically serve as the feedback process for which you can initiate the, the, the next stage of the model uh, development, right? So it's just some three or four simple processes. I'll talk a bit uh, more about uh, each one of them and especially what tools you can use to, to address them. But uh, I think we're kind of ready to, to think about the definition of MLOps, right? And it's not because I care a lot about the definition, it's because I, I really want to, to have a natural thought process between where it is used and how it, how it is used to what actually are we trying to achieve in general. One thing for me that, that I hope is clear for you by now is MLOps is not about changing the way radically that models are deployed, are, are developed, trained, deployed, and so on. It's actually a bit more localized than that. It's about having a strong set of, uh, let's say, processes that you apply during the whole process that uh, are going towards the three goals that I mentioned, speed and ease of development, of deployment, and continuous verification. And this is where this, these processes, tracking, orchestration, CICD, and continuous monitoring go in. So, and it, this is just one of a thousand definitions for MLOps that I, I wrote. MLOps, as I see it, is, basic, is a process or set of processes that is focused on standardizing and automating the collaboration, deployment, validation, and monitoring of machine learning systems, which kind of touches on all of the, the different points that uh, I've had before. Well, definitions are for college anyway, right? So <laughs> it's not really relevant. What for me is more relevant is the next point. You might be thinking, yeah, well, I mean, I already kind of do that. I use Git to share my code, or I use Git to track this. or And yes, and we all, all kind of are. It's difficult nowadays to, to work on, on models without using at least some set of standard tools. Um, MLOps in itself, these processes are present in all the steps of the life cycle. But the important thing is the, proce the processes that you choose to use should be adjusted to your use case. So well, although I highlighted some, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, need, you should use all of them or that you need to use all of them because some may, might make sense for you, some might not. Like, Maybe monitoring doesn't make sense for what you're doing. These are just some core principles. And the important part is that you go towards the direction of improving the, the, the process of machine learning through uh, the, the, the core principles that I mentioned before. And uh, also, we just to, if you check online on Google uh, for some definitions, a lot of them include model development or include data as well. Uh, obviously, it's also part of MLOps 
or at least there's a lot of techniques from MLOps that you apply during those stages. But I'm just I'm not going to talk a lot about them because uh, I feel like it's also a bit confusing what when uh, what machine learning engineering is, what MLOps is. So we'll and also I, I think you guys are probably all, all experienced in uh, in the model development part. So I, I want to focus a bit more on the other. Uh, more, let's say, technical parts outside of the research or the, the actual constructing the, the model code. Yeah, so that kind of closes the door at the definition. Um, but I th it really exciting for, uh, for me now is talk a bit about these stages and what is currently used in industry or some of the possibilities from the thousands of possibilities that are widely used in the industry to do each one of these things. And um, the one that I didn't mention before is data. Uh, but it's my first step here. And I did mention tracking. And the thing about data is <laughs> it's a bit uh, similarly to model development. It's also a lot in the field of, that is also, uh, usually called data engineering, right? And not all people that work in MLOps will be working directly with the data, depending on the composition of the team. Nevertheless, if you're working alone on a small company, it's very much important that you are familiar with these, uh, with these processes because there is no way that you can track or fully reproduce the, the process of your model without also being able to track the data and track the pipelines that generated the data and track the data sets that were used to generate, to train that model. So it is essential that you are also at least familiar with the techniques for tracking data, for monitoring data, and especially because it's actually a very hard task. Uh, data sets might be huge. Uh, they use like distributed computing. They are mutable. They change very easily. They sometimes are extracted from dubious sources. So it is not uh, an easy process. And there's a couple of tools that in the industry, uh, if you are very focused on using a GitOps, so to say, so a very Git-based uh, workflow, there's Git large file storage, which is basically a plugin for Git, which allows you to track huge files in your, in your Git without basically breaking everything. I don't know if you have tried to clone, to put a large file in your Git repository, but it kind of breaks everything. So use Git LFS if you want to do that. There's also some more uh, focused tools. There's DVC. Very, very interesting tool, which is data version control, which is like a Git CLI, but for data. So it tr it's able to track data changes. It tracks what generated the data, the pipelines, uh, with a very familiar interface, because it's entirely based on Git, the Git interface. And then there's Pachyderm, which is a bit more complete solution, already stretching a, a bit to the model side and tracking the what models were generated by what data. It has a nice UI. It is also very easily, easy to use and adapt. Um, and by the way, I'll be focusing a bit on Python and the environment around Python. But some of those tools also work in a DVC, works in whatever you want to use. Uh, but just because it's kind of the de, de facto standard nowadays for, for machine learning. Uh, I hope I don't offend anyone that uses R uh, in the process. <laughs> anyway, the purpose of, of this uh, data stage then is it's very simple auditable and collaborative data lineage. It, this is what we need to, uh, to, to go towards the tracking, uh, as we discussed before. Now, the next step is one of the most, <clears throat> is one of the most uh, important ones, tracking. And it's one of where the heavyweights of, of the MLOps also uh, uh, fall in, because the other stages can be done by more industry standard tools, but tracking in itself is a, it's the main core of MLOps framework, specific MLOps frameworks, and it's the main core of uh, tasks that are done by specialized tools. And by tracking, we are talking about a lot of things. Tracking code, so obviously you can track code using Git, and you should track code using Git. Uh, and these usually these tools also integrate with Git, but it also means tracking model runs, so training runs, experimentation, uh, and all of the different steps that take you from an idea to having a model that you train that is ready to deploy to production. If you are working in a team, having all of these runs documented, all of the parameters that you try documented, all of the results and scores that you obtain from each run documented, goes a long way to asynchronously to working asynchronously, but also to creating auditable uh, and easy to easy to replicate models. So if you need to run the model in different environments, you will be able to because you store the parameters, you store the data sets, you store the code, the environment, and all of that. And also, you will know who the author of the training was and the code change or of the model deployment. And, and that is very important if you want to assess or debug a model that is in production and you need to understand where that model generated from, uh, where that, uh, what were actually the, the situation in which, which it was trained, why it was replaced, 
a lot of questions can be avoided, uh, answered and sometimes avoided if we take a bit of time in the beginning to make sure we integrate the models in these platforms that are very, that have a lot of uh, information. So I'll show you one of those in a bit uh, in the demo and we can go a bit more in detail on how they, uh, how they, they uh, attract things and uh, which things can be tracked uh, easily, which things are a little bit more difficult. But most importantly, is to use a tool that is, allows us to have a reproducible but also traceable model lifecycle so that we can look back and understand exactly uh, what happened. And here's uh, some tool, some of the most used tools in the, the market, weights and biases. <laughs> I'll skip the introductions because you guys have the, the great talk um, already on weights and biases. Feel uh, also take a look at it. It's a very cool talk if you're interested in these tools. You have ML flow, which is kind of widely used in the, in the industry. It's also part of the Kubeflow uh, tool set. And, it's, and it very much allows you to track model runs, to track the actual models that are in staging, deployed. It allows you to serve the models in some way, which we'll talk in a bit, and also allows you to um, do a lot of small different things with uh, packaging the environment, using Docker, using all of these tools. So it's kind of one in, uh, one in all in one Swiss army knife of uh, model tracking and also like model lifecycle in a way. MetaML is similar, is a bit newer, but also has some very cool principles, especially like on the way that they extract requirements automatically. They kind of go search through the code in a in a like depth first search manner, try to find everything that is related to your code. So pretty cool. And then Neptune AI, which uh, I th I'm pretty convinced is a, ML, a managed ML flow with a couple of changes. Uh, it's an extremely cool platform, by the way. Don't take me wrong, but uh, it's there's a lot of similarities with ML flow even in the concepts. So if you understand one, you'll understand the other. In any way. I highly recommend using one of those if you're working on models. It has databases, it, it stores all the information, and a lot of, and some of those, uh, especially uh, Neptune, have uh, managed the uh, services, so you don't even need to have your servers to run them. You can just try the free version or maybe uh, pay a bit for a deployed or team version. Cool. Now we're going to go a bit quicker because then we start to fall on the, let's say, realm of the non. Um, ML-focused uh, parts. On the orchestration side, uh, it's all about providing your data, your team the all the infrastructure that they need throughout, throughout the whole process to be able to not only train the models, but also then in deploy in development to run the models and also care uh, cons to concerned about uh, uh, how we access the model results once they are in production. Because there's multiple ways you can do that. There's you can run the models in batch. You can provide APIs. You can use inference servers, and all of these. Are um, and all of these are very important aspects that need to be dealt with, especially uh, especially because models are complex in terms of infrastructure that they need. They usually need GPUs, and uh, setting that up is not an easy task. So it's very important that these environments are automated, that they are highly available, so and that they are easy to access. Some of the tools that are uh, very used in this field, you have um, Triton, for example, which is an inference server, which is a a server where you can upload your models uh, and very efficiently serve them, especially if you have GPUs on the machine in which you're running Triton. And then a bit focused on more on the whole page. Uh, you probably, if you know Kubeflow, you're going to complain like, hey, it does not only do orchestration. Yeah, but it's basically a tool for, for deploying machine learning into Kubernetes. So it does a lot of things. It also integrates ML flow. It also integrates workflows. But um, most, most importantly, it takes a lot of the complication out of uh, dealing with infrastructure and orchestration out of your hands and into the hands of, uh, of the software. And then you have more managed uh, ends of solutions like SageMaker, which is everything's a dashboard uh, or a very simple Python S, uh, CLI. You pay, you, they are much more expensive, obviously, but they're also much easier to use. And uh, they're very easy to create a notebook, deploy a model to production. They are, uh, SageMaker is, even has like stuff such as tracking, uh, similarly to MLflow, so you can, it's a one-stop shop managed that, are, that does everything from orchestration to tracking. Um, the next one is CI/CD, and this one is very in line with the industry standards. To in order to ensure that your your code is continuously being tested and continuously being deployed, you, you <coughs> it's, it's important not only like in software that you test the code and the execution, but you should also be looking at testing the results. So testing what comes out of your model and ensuring that um, the results are within expectations. So there's usually a lot of things that you can already assert about your model uh, and about how it runs. So those assumptions that you can make are great assumptions to test continuously. 
because it will catch the simplest errors, like you broke something in your model, but it also will catch sometimes more complex errors, like you did a change that broke the system down the road, which takes me to the next point. Models are usually integrated in the system and are not living isolated when we're talking about deployment. So CI is not only about like running your model on inputs, but it's also running the whole system and, I, and trying to identify if the different new model has any impact in the system itself. So if it, it, the model may improve performance and the system degrade performance, uh, it's a bit paradoxical, but it can happen quite easily actually. Uh, so that's the part about CI is continuously testing everything. And this is mainly to allow to us to do CD. CD is continuous deployment and it's as easy as this. Every single commit that you make to like a production branch, for example, you're gonna deploy your model automatically. Uh, obviously there's other types of CD that are not Git based uh, like Argo CD, for example. But what is important is we are gonna automate the process of deployment, one click of a button and you do not need to care about anything else. And this is extremely important on the ease of, ease of deployment and speed of deployment, especially for teams that uh, take a system that already has all of this dealt with. And the objective in the end is just deploy things fast, but also do not lose the quality guarantees of, of your deployment, right? The tools that are used for this are just basically CI/CD tools. You have uh, Git, uh, GitLab CI/CD, Azure DevOps, GitHub Actions, any of the CI/CD tool that you can use. Um, it's particularly if it can be customized, it should be able to be adapted to uh, MLOps. And the final point, also very brief, that I want to talk to you about is monitoring. Monitoring is something that is done, obviously, in DevOps and software engineering. Also, you might usually a lot of people monitor their models. There's nothing in particularly uh, different about this type of, uh, about uh, the way that the process applied by MLOps in monitoring. The only thing that is important is to understand that we're not only trying to monitor the more technical parts like the latency, resource usage, errors, but also trying to monitor the results continuously, the results of the model. So we, we ideally are, are, we would be putting a process in place that every once in a while we'll check if the model results still make sense. That is trying to identify model drift. So if the business requirements change, the model might start to lose performance. And this is something that we need to be aware of, even if it's not easy to test, right? These are the types of, of practices that as an MLOps engineer, you should be trying to set up for your, um, for your team in order to have them also have a feedback loop, a kind of automatic feedback loop that they will understand as soon as they need to retrain that specific model or as soon as they need to, to do some sort of fix that uh, uh, resolves the change in performance, right? So the, the goal in monitoring is very similar to CICD is to ensure the quality and connect, correctness, but instead of doing the deployment process is after the deployment process, during the time that the model is just running in production. And there's a very standard set of tools for that. Grafana and Prometheus are used almost everywhere um, nowadays. Obviously, there's other databases like InfluxDB, whatever can store like a timestamp value uh, is good for monitoring. And then there's tools like Sentry, which is awesome, by the way, if you do anything in uh, a lot of different languages. Sentry is an error uh, tolerant, an error uh, identification and investigation framework. You connect Sentry to your, your application, and then it's going to log all of the errors and a lot of information that you can use to debug later on, especially useful for things in running in production. And something more focused in uh, AI. Uh, machine learning is uh, something like ARISE, ARISE, for example, which is a dashboard that's more focused on identifying uh, data drift and model drift and tracking data distribution over time. It goes a bit into the data engineering side of things. But again, as I said, it might just be that you need to, to work it out as well. Right? So these are some of the tools and the, the, the processes that, as an MLOps engineer, you will be trying to implement on your team. You'll be looking to provide them with these tools, especially to reach the goals that we talked about. And uh, I'm not going to repeat because I think I've probably re repeated myself enough. Um, and with this said, uh, I've heard of uh, this uh, sentence a lot lately. Talk is cheap. Uh, it's easy to, to talk, I guess, if you have a script in front of you. Uh, but what, what is cool about this is that we can actually kind of take this and, uh, and get this into a demo that shows you how this in practice looks like. And it's not just uh, something in a, note, in a textbook that uh, I'm reading. So let's put this in practice. Um, let's start by a, with, with a simple scenario, right? Let's start from scratch. And we're going to create a classifier for the Iris data set, which I think everyone knows. And we want to serve this as, as an API, right? So we're going to start with just this, like a train Py script and, um, <coughs> and, um, and the definition of a server, an API to, to serve this model. 
and we want to integrate this in the world of MLOps. So I'm going to kind of do the process that as an MLOps engineer, you, you would be doing uh, in practice to, to make this a, like a, a nicely well-integrated machine learning system. And what is that in particular? So we're just taking back on the points that we talked before. We want to add some tracking to the training runs, to the results of the training runs. We want to make sure it's easy to collaborate on the code and on training. You want to make sure there's accountability for what happens on, for the operations, such as training and production deployments. We want to make sure um, there's reproducibility everywhere possible. So we try to reproduce environments, data sets. We want to use CI CD processes because we want to make sure that, like, with a click of a button, we can uh, do the whole thing. And finally, we could add uh, some external monitoring. Uh, it would be great. Um, and one other point on this uh, challenge that I made myself is I want to do this. But I want, to, I want to do it all with managed services. So what I mean is I want to do it all with services that you can go on the website, register for a free account, and <clears throat> you uh, are able to actually reproduce the tutorial on your site. There's going to be a, a repository with everything. You just plug in your uh, API keys, and uh, yeah, hopefully it will work. Um, before we actually jump into the code, because it's a bit, I actually wanted to code everything with you guys, uh, <laughs> to be honest. And then I realized it probably need like two hours and a half to, to do it. And uh, Katarina would kick me off way before that. So um, I resorted to having to having a starting point, very simple, and then bringing each one of the pieces of the puzzle to, to the demo. The, um, but I still want to run through the whole system and what we're trying to do first. So to also make more sense of what I'm going to show you. Um, so we're going to begin with a very simple model, scikit-learn model. We're going to use Poetry and Docker for reproducible environments. Uh, Poetry is just a Python framework that does a great job at uh, locking down uh, uh, dependencies, which is important for uh, reproducible environments. We're going to use a Git repository for code tracking, because what else am I going to use? Um, and then during training runs and during development, we're going to use Neptune uh, to track those uh, training runs. And finally, we're, as every time we commit to the master branch, I, I want to run a CI CD process that does the following that tests my model, that registers my model as being deployed to production, and that actually deploys that model. And the way that we're going to have the model deployed is we're going to, because that's a bit going more into the DevOps, doing like a whole Kubernetes setup, et cetera, would be very time consuming. So I'm going to just use Heroku, which is a, quite a nice managed uh, application service, which you can use to, to deploy things very easily. So you just kind of give it a Docker container and it deploys it, magic. We're going to use the CI CD to deploy that container with the new model. And then we're going to monitor it using uh, InfluxDB and Grafana managed services as well. So all, all, all of this either is uh, open source tools like uh, scikit-learn and uh, Poetry, uh, free to use tools like Docker, uh, GitHub Actions, or managed services like Neptune, InfluxDB, Grafana and Heroku, which you can actually have a free account without any, uh, and you can run this example without paying anything. So this is the point where I switch to my screen, if I can. So let's see. So George just left. <laughs> this is not. <laughs> This is not switching to my screen. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, wrong button, guys. I'm sorry. So let's try again. Ah, OK, cool. All right. Uh, and now let me um, open everything to show you. I think this is correct. Yeah, looks good. OK, cool. Um, so as I said, we're going to start very simple. We're going to start in a, with a Git repository um, in, in this folder. Uh, and I'll up demo start. And we we'll have just a couple of things in, in here. We have a data set folder and the models folder. The data set folder is uh, X is just as a training and test data set. I don't know that the Iris data set from scikit-learn.datasets package. And I put it in uh, NumPy files. And then uh, I did this train file, which is trivial, um, just loading the data, loading some parameters from my model, using a passive aggressive classifier because I like the name, uh, and feeding the, the classifier, scoring it, and then saving it in the folder models uh, model.pico. There's a lot to say about the way that I'm going to store the model in this demo. 
So please ask me about it if you're interested after the, the demo. Uh, it's definitely not the best way possible, but uh, it's uh, for a small demo, it kind of works. Sure. Then I have to... Yeah. Sorry, can, can we just increase a little bit the font size of the terminal? Um, yes, I can. Okay. Good. Cool. I think so. If anyone uh, feels that it should be a bit uh, larger, please let me know in the comments below. Thank you, George. <laughs> I pressed the subscribe button. Um, anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, I have another file, which is a requirements txt. If you use Python, this is very familiar with you, but except I did this like the wrong way. I just dumped everything in here without versions, without anything. And this is all my requirements and someone that is from the software engineering or whatever that deals with this. And then I have this main.py file. I'm going to go in a bit more detail. Uh, we're actually going to move this from here. It's not needed for now. And I, this is very simply a Flask application in a web server. The only thing that it does is it loads my model from this models.model.pickle folder. It uh, has a method to run my model, and then it has a single uh, endpoint, which is a slash predict, in which you can submit any amount of data points for a model, and I'll return you the predictions of the model. So this is literally an API that serves the, a model that predicts the data dataset, and it's quite uh, simple. <clears throat> so now let's start somewhere. Um, one thing that I want to do is start with reproducibility. Obviously, we have this uh, trend of pi file, which kind of outputs the model to this models dot model dot uh, uh, pickle file. We can run it. It's going to um, put the model there. But the thing is, how do I guarantee that someone else can clone my repository and uh, clone my repository and actually get the same results if this is all I have, right? So this is where poetry comes in. Poetry is, some, is a very cool tool that you basically give it a, a set of requirements and it's going to solve to the whole map, the whole uh, graph uh, dependencies to solve the exact versions of, of the requirements that you need to be running or that makes sense to be running with your current requirements. And then it's going to actually give you one requirements, very complete requirements file with a single version log, uh, for every single, not only uh, library that I put here, but also every single dependency. So that's kind of step one of making my environment reproducible, right? Is everyone uses the same library versions. Now, unfortunately, Poetry takes a long time to run, really long time. So I'm going to kind of cheat, use my other folder, which has uh, some magic files, and uh, I'm just going to go through them. Instead of starting from a requirements, because that's what we're trying to generate with the correct versions, we start from a pi project file, which is very similar uh, for for poetry, except we I put a, some of some versions here of what I want, but I didn't actually put the, the right version. I just said I want higher than 1.8.0, higher than 1.0.2. It actually does this based on your environment. It's, it's not even manual. And then when you can you do poetry update, and it's gonna do the second step of um, of the, the process, which is to generate the lock file. Uh, poetry lock file is basically a file that locks the versions of everything. So it's going to, not only for your libraries, but all the dependencies that you have from, this, it's got, uh, from these requirements, it's going to choose a version that solves correctly so that everything fits together with their, within their actual dependencies. And it generates this lock file. And then based on this lock file, it generates this monster of a requirements file, which is actually, you are installing exactly the same amount of libraries that you would without uh, using Poetry, except all of the libraries that you are installing are very specific versions. So now, if there's something in scikit-learn that changes the way that the model works, for example, or any other dependency, uh, I am sort of have a guarantee that if I use this requirements uh, file to build my system and give it to someone else, they're at least in terms of the library code are going to have exactly the same versions as I do. Because if I did my poetry file correctly, this is everything that I need to run, not only the model, but also the API serving the model and so on. So that's kind of step one of reproducibility. And step two of reproducibility is ensuring that, OK, now for development and training, I can kind of use this poetry uh, generated requirements to, um, to have the same environment as my colleague. But how do we ensure that we also have the same exact environment to production every single time, and that I can actually reuse this environment locally if I need to test what's going on? This is where Docker comes in. So <clears throat> if you're not familiar, Docker is a containerization tool, but it's not a, uh, necessarily a virtual machine. It's a bit higher level than a virtual machine. However, what it allows you is to kind of create a recipe saying, 
okay, I have a, want a container. We, and inside that container, I want just a couple of things. I want just these requirements. I want the Python library, and I want a couple more things. And you create a, a very a recipe that is kind of deterministic. And it builds, and the output is a sort of it's a binary con, uh, image of that container. And that binary, you can reuse as many times as you want, and how many times, uh, as, a, as many architectures as you want, that it's going to kind of work as a virtual machine in the sense that it's always going to be the same thing, the same outputs. And yeah, obviously, if you're familiar, there's a couple exceptions. In general, it's a great tool and very used and used a lot because uh, tools like Kubernetes, for example, run on top of containers. So everything that you need to run on a cluster kind of needs to be containerized first. So I'm going to steal my other pre, my uh, Docker file. Let's take a look at it because uh, it's very simple. Uh, if you never used, it's also very simple to to use. I understand if you're familiar with Docker that this is not the perfect Docker file. It's actually, <laughs> I would uh, get uh, scolded by uh, anyone from DevOps. But anyway, it works for our purpose. So we're uh, on the first line. We just say what is the base image for container that we're trying to use. Luckily, there's some very useful ones for Python with the correct Python version. And then we are going to copy the requirements that we have locally. We're going to install inside the container the requirements, and then we're going to copy the files for our server, and that's it. And then we're going to run the, the web server. This is basically running the Flask application. That is literally it. We're just defining a very simple set of a uh, very simple recipe to run our uh, system. And uh, this recipe, if I build it locally, should have be a reproducible environment uh, that is similar, that is the same, because these requirements are also blocked by poetry should be the same because we're starting from the same base image, which is basically the same virtualized uh, environment. So th this goes a long way to, to having a, a reproducible environment. And this, um, there's a couple more things that you need to do. But if you're doing this, you already are quite uh, well set, right? So let's go to the next step. And the next step I want to uh, uh, go through, you guys, is using Neptune and uh, to track the, the training process. Uh, so Neptune is this self-hosted, uh, is this managed uh, platform, as I said. And it's very, very easy to use. Actually, it's similar to MLflow and also Wits and Vice is very simple. To track a model run, the only thing you need to do, uh, other than having an API key, is basically you import Neptune, uh, something like uh, you're going to, I'm going to copy this from, from another file, but you're going to import Neptune here. And then you're going to say, like, you're going to give your run, your training run a name. So you're going to, this is my print about my file, by the way. I actually probably would need to import OS as well. So we're going to um, create a, a run. And the run is just saying a pro project, which is a project I've created before. I'll show you in a second. And give it a name. So let's say this model that I'm going to train, this is the name, train model dash one. And now it's registered in the Neptune. And the only thing that we need to do is to say what are the artifacts from running this uh, model that we actually want to register. And it actually has very useful tools that integrate directly with scikit-learn that extract a whole lot of information. I'm not going to use them. I'm just going to show you uh, how you could um, very simply do this. Actually, this could be something like, you know, I could just pass the file directly, for example. And most importantly, what is this telling me? It's telling me create a run, call this train model one, and we train the model, we calculate the score, and then let's say, OK, on this training run, Let's store the score as this value. Let's store all my parameters that I've used as params. And also, let's store the pickled model as well. So we actually are storing the, the model in Neptune as well, together with all of the other information. And Neptune is going to extract more information. For example, it's going to extract who is doing this training run because of your API key, which should be unique. It's going to extract uh, OS parameters, such as CPU usage, et cetera. It's going to extract a lot of uh, information. But most importantly, uh, it's going to make this whole training process very trackable because it's also going to store the train.py file, the, the environments, and the requirements. It's uh, kind of uh, the, the uh, helping a lot towards tracking the, the whole process. And uh, I'll show you in a second what it looks like when you run this. Let's just go through the, the, the other steps. Uh, and then I'll do a, a run of the whole thing. So this is adding Neptune to training. And then the next step is testing the model. And testing the model, obviously, can be very complex. I'm going to just do very simple tests because I just want to show you the, base, the basic um, thought process between testing your model. So usually when you're testing software, you can do like unit tests where you're testing very small uh, parts of your code. Here, I created this test.py file. 
And the only thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to load data that the model is supposed to take, and I'm going to test two things. I'm going to try and load the model that is going to be deployed to production, and I'm going to try to uh, predict one sample, and I expect to get one sample back. And then I also am going to calculate the score for the whole test data set, and I expect a very reasonable score that is uh, larger than 0.1. And the purpose of these two tests is kind of you're testing if there's smoke, you know, if there's smoke, there's fire. If some of this goes wrong, obviously you have a huge problem. But you can think there's a lot of other assumptions that you could probably do with your model in which you could test them. You can even do more like internal tests of your model. And there's a lot of things that, that uh, you can, that uh, are machine learning specific that you can test, not only like code execution. Uh, it's very easy to do. <clears throat> and this allows us to make changes with the underlying model without uh, fearing that I'm going to break something as simple as how many uh, predictions I make per sample or breaking something as simple as having a very reasonable score, right? And if you increase the number of assumptions that you're testing here, you're going to increase, obviously, the how tight and how, how good you are, uh, how, how secure you are when you're doing, you're doing a change. Obviously, there's a big part of this test that makes it relevant, which is running it automatically. I'll get there in a second. First of all, first, before that, let's talk very quickly about deployment. As I said, I'm going to deploy this whole system with Heroku. And it's very easy to deploy because you saw that I've created a Docker file. Uh, I, it's running a web server. And to, to deploy this to Heroku, it's literally one thing. You kind of say, hey, here's my container Docker file. Can you build it and uh, deploy it as a web app? And it does both things on their side, on their system. Um, and actually, I'm also going to do that through the CI CD process on GitHub Actions. So it's even simpler. And you, I don't need to run anything locally. And the second part of deployment is the following. There's one thing on the initial, I, I'm not going to open slides, but there's one thing on the slides that I wanted to do, which is when I deploy the system, I also want to register what model it is that I'm going to de deploy, to, uh, that I will be deploying to production, because that's when the whole thing, the whole uh, CI CD process triggers. I want to register in Neptune, so that, that is tied to the training run, that is tied to who did the production deployment, and all of that information is completely traceable. So every time, on this my mock system that I would go to Neptune, I could see exactly what generated the model that is currently in production, what are the training score, who did what. There's a lot of information that it, there's a, a, a lot of information that you can take from there that is a, kind of a one-stop shop. And finally, uh, the monitoring part. And the monitoring part is, again, very trivial because this is a simple example. Let's say that we have our main.py file. We are running the model here, right? And the only thing that we want to monitor is, for example, the latent. We're going to monitor the latency of our model, and we're going to monitor <coughs> register, let's say, the batch size that the model is calculated. Obviously, these are kind of useless statistics. Uh, the latency, not, but the batch size is. Uh, it's just for the to show how easy it is to have something running in production that is just outputting metrics somewhere else, and then you could think of it as uh, if you have a complex model that is that is in PyTorch, for example, you could do log some very internal metrics during production. You could uh, uh, do some actually pretty complex uh, procedures to, to ensure that you're monitoring internal values and everything is going according to plan and there's like no uh, data drifting occurring. However, this is a very simple classifier with a very simple data set and very simple solution. So I'll just, um, I'll just do very simple monitoring. Uh, I'm just going to replace the file because I think I'm going a bit over time. Um, oh, I did some changes. Right, so the only thing that I did, I added, uh, oh, I added these two method calls, right point, and I'm saying write a point for production model for the metric runtime that stores the elapsed time, and I calculate the elapsed time, and also store the batch size that I used on this inference, and that's the length of the data input. Uh, Writing to influx is very simple. I wrote, uh, simplified the writing to influx as this simple script called influx. I did it just to save time. If you check out influx, it's literally four lines of, uh, actually three lines of code to write a data point, and you can check it out in the repository after. And uh, yeah, finally, the deployment and the CICD and the whole magic of automating this. So the cool part about um, the cool part about the automation is that when you're doing the when you're you have these all these separate steps they kind of look very difficult to run in, in separate processes and your mlops engineer is just kind of making your life hell because you have to do a lot of things but as soon as you start to put 
put them in automated processes, they start to go the other way around. They start to increase your productivity because you're not worried about breaking the model. You're not worrying about your new complex experiment model breaking the system. Everything is being tested and everything is actually deployable and usually also revertible with a click. So you get a lot of freedom. And the way that we do this in this project is through GitHub Actions. GitHub Actions are basically just ways that you can say to GitHub, look, when I do, do something, like when I commit to master, can you please run this set of instructions? Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through the, the creation of, of this workflow in particular, but it's very simple. So let's take a look at it. Um, what, I'm doing, what I'm doing here, I actually can select this. <clears throat> uh, so I'm just, it, this is YAML, and I'm just defining a, a workflow. So everything that is separated by a line, by an empty line, is kind of referring to a new different action. So what I'm saying is, yo, GitHub, every time I uh, on push to main, every time I push to main, do the following steps in order, please. Like check out the code, whatever, get a repository, set up Python, basically get Python working on the worker that's going to run this, install my requirements in order to be able to test, and Okay, run testing. So that, here's the first guarantee. Every time you do a commit, if the tests are not running, are not working, our uh, pipeline will fail. And this is testing our model and possibly the model results, right? Remember, it's checking the score, right? It's not only testing the code. The second point, uh, hey, GitHub, please deploy the model. Oh, I forgot to, to check out the deploy pie. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a second. But the second, after testing, uh, it says, okay, we're going to release the production. Then I'm going to tell Neptune, look, uh, I'm going to deploy this model. And the final action of the workflow is to say, OK, here's my application. Please build it and deploy it as a new application. Um, here's a Docker file, and there's a couple more. And this is a web server, right? And this is enough for Heroku to check the Docker file, clone the repository in their, on their side, <clears throat> get the files on their side, actually, and, uh, and deploy it as a, as a web app. It's a quite simple process. So this last uh, file that I need to check is uh, that I need to show you is deploy by very simple as well. It's literally just uh, <clears throat> initially before production, we take the model again and we say to Neptune, hey, look, we're going to move this model to production. Uh, so if we check it out, we just give it the model name and a model key. This is, it can give it whatever model name and key you want. And you're, you're saying, uh, Neptune, here is a new model version for my project. Uh, and this is the model that I'm going to use, set it to production. And this is going to show up on the uh, dashboard of Neptune, which I can show you now. It's going to show up as uh, the model that is going to run in production. So this is, the, this is Neptune. The, AI, the UI for Neptune has some projects. So this is the project that I created for this demo. You'll see on the run side that there's a table that tracks all of the different runs uh, all of the different runs that I've that I've done so far in this project, for, and also some of the stuff that I stored. So, I, for example, I stored the params. Uh, Max it there. You can see I have two runs: one with an hundred iterations, one with two, and you can see that the scores are different because obviously with more iterations here, it is necessary to get a better score. Uh, but if you click on a run, there's a lot more information that uh, Neptune is storing. You remember I only stored three things: the pickle model, and uh, scores and params. But it stores more things. So one of the things it stores. All of these different like memory users, CPU usage, and so on about doing the run, it might not be interested. You have the pickle model, which you can download. You have all the parameters that I stored. You have the score. Um, but you also have the source code. So for one of the things that it does, for example, it's, it's going ex to extracts my train.py file. And well, it's, it's loading, might take a bit. Uh, it extracts my train.py file and, allow, and stores what was the training script that I used to train. It also stores all of the information on Git, of Git. So the commit that I was, uh, what is my Git username, uh, how to check out the, exactly this version of the code if you want to reproduce on your site. And remember, this is useful because when you check out this, you're going to get the correct requirements and the correct Docker file if you want to run the training inside uh, the Docker file, for example. So when I do a new run, it's going to show up here. Uh, I, I promise I'm all, almost done. Um, and then on the model side, um, when I, uh, when I deploy model to production, it's going to show up here. Well, they're all in production because actually I kind of lied. I'm not set, I'm setting the other models out of production stage, so they will all show as production. It's a very simple thing to do, but a bit out of scope of, of the demo. But more importantly, with this, uh, uh, with this information, I also know exactly what date the model was deployed, by whom, 
and I can check the, the rest of the information as well of, as well as which was the run that originated the, the model in itself. So as you can see, there's already a lot of trackability in, by using Neptune uh, that goes a long way towards uh, satisfying some of, uh, I just realized that it's a bit small, so I'm sorry for that. <laughs> I was looking at my screen, I hope, uh, yeah, okay. And yeah, so just a couple more, uh, more things. <clears throat> Uh, just want to show you now the actually the whole thing. So with all this said, why is this good? Well, because of this. So I'm going to go to the actual repository, not the one that I cleared specifically to show you. Um, and let's do something. Let's go to train.py. Let's change the number of iterations to 200, for example. And let's uh, train a new model. And also, let's make sure we have sourced the correct environment variables. And the right things. It's going to take a bit, train the model, send it to, it's going to send this training run to Neptune. So if you open it here, there it is, our latest training run, and you can check the score 0789 and the parameters that we used. Cool. So now if we look at our kit, here's what we have, the new model and the modified training file. We don't need to even need to store the training file because the parameters that we used are, are stored on the Neptune, but whatever. Let's just add the models and also the training file. And let's say a the model. And now in theory, this is all it takes on this system that has been kind of MLOPsized to deploy something to production. Because what happens now is that on the model itself, it's going to start an action uh, that uh, was defined on the workflow. And this action has a couple stages. Oh, please tell me this is going to run. Uh, sometimes GitHub has, oh, cool, OK. And this is, uh, see, the actions that I defined. So set it, setting up Python, installing the requirements, look, it's the specific versions that are on the requirements generated by Poetry. And then it's going to test. And if it passes testing, it's going to tell uh, Neptune that the model is being deployed, and it's going to release the new application to Heroku. And finally, we could just to show that it's actually working, we could go here. And this is basically just a requests file. Actually, let me show you on the desk code. This is just a requests file um, that sends a sends a post request to the endpoint of predict with uh, one sample, which is the dimensionality of the dataset is four features, and prints a response. So if you check this out, if it's working and not actually uh, depends a bit. If it's rolling out, it might be a bit slow. We'll see. Oh. So if you run it, you should get an answer back from the server. It might take a while because we probably caught it in the process of replacing the servers. But once it's accessible again, it's going to give you give us an answer. It's also very slow because Heroku is a free account and they literally just shut down your containers and then turn it on when you request them. But anyway, this is it. I know it's a lot of information uh, on the demo, but I really wanted to go through the whole process with you guys. Uh, oh, there we go. And the class is zero. And I don't know which Iris type this is, uh, but there we go. So we did one, com we used one script. Ah, also forgot it, forgot to prove to you guys, but there's also uh, the run is reg registered here. Oh, uh, the new model version set 7.19.33 is here. And the runs, yeah, here, 31. So this. All of this was also automatic. And we're just running one script and doing one commit. We do the whole process. We build the Docker file. We do the whole tracking, containerization, deployment, monitoring. Uh, I didn't actually show you the, the dashboard, but well, it's a Grafana dashboard that is receiving data. And it's a, a cloud instance. And it's receiving data from the, um, it's receiving data from the, from the influx script running on Flask. So yeah, just a bit of connection with uh, environment variables. And I'm sorry for overrunning time, but uh, that this is it. OK, thank you, George, for this great uh, talk. I'm sure it will be consulted many, many, many times by a lot of people after the fact. So thank you so much and for taking the time to do the demo with all the problems that all worked out well. So yeah. Maybe we can ask a few questions. We have two questions in the chat. I'll ask you also one or two. Uh, we can start with this one from Luigi. Um, 
Yeah, he's saying something about how not so long, long ago individuals had no access to GPU, TPU resources on cloud solutions. And so he's asking what's the cheapest way to efficiently uh, train models for personal projects. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's just a, a bit of a sidetrack before going to the question. It's funny because it kind of is what triggered the whole uh, revolution of machine learning, right? The increasing power in very small consumer graphics and then availability in cloud in huge quantities and that kind of kickstarted the ability to use uh, huge models. Anyway, um, on your question, it's a very good question because <laughs> GPU resources on the cloud are extremely expensive, like eye-watering expensive. Um, and there is, unfortunately, other than using Google Colab uh, and sucking the res as much resources as they allow you, although it's like some uh, slower GPUs usually acceptable, or having your own GPU, which now they are very much capable, uh, especially good enabled GPUs from NVIDIA, uh, there is really no way to. And so I, I assume that you're asking more about the GPU, uh, up to the GPU side of, of training, because otherwise, there are some available CPU resources that you could use for training. However, they need to be for very small models uh, because you're, it, a lot of the companies right now are very aware of not providing free CPU resources because they kind of get sucked by uh, crypto miners. Everything that is for free and does compute is abused by crypto miners and thus we poor data scientists suffer from it, which is sad. That's why they kinda, the, the GPU access is a little bit different. Okay, as a follow-up, maybe I can also uh, ask something, which is you mentioned that the models are getting larger and larger. And so all this process of storing and uh, in, a, in order to have um, accountability and repro reproducibility, I am asking you how realistic it is, the assumption like, oh, let's just store all the models and whether there are some good practices like Maybe some of the models we are not as interested in saving, or for example, if we ran a huge grid search, and what 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 is a common practice uh, to deal with these kind of uh, decisions, trade offs that you have to to do? Yeah. Um, so the the good part that is that storage is also getting cheaper, it's particularly some formats of cold storage. So it is uh, in. Uh, with some caveats. So let's say you're open AI and you're training this huge uh, in, in, in not even graspable models that they do. Maybe this is not correct, but for most of the companies that train relatively sized models, like in the hundreds of megabytes, it's very much uh, possible to store everything. Uh, a lot of these tools uh, that do tracking also do uh, storage tiering. So they, let's say they put your model in hot storage for 30 days and then they move it to cold storage and then to move it like to fro frozen storage. So they keep moving it down to slower and slower and uh, more expensive to access, but least, uh, less expensive to uh, keep. So it's actually very reasonable too that you keep everything. Uh, data sets is a bit different, right? Data sets is usually because the models for huge data are comparably smaller uh, than the data sets themselves. Thank you, George, for this detailed answer. Um, I think we also have here a question from Andre Pinto. Uh, I think it, it concerns the model of saving formats of the, the demo and whether there are better alternatives to pickle. Yeah. Um, so, well, I mean, uh, sort of like pickle uh, by default, I think Scikit-learn actually kind of use, it probably uses Joblib, I think. Uh, pickle itself as advantages which are there ex it's extremely easy to use and it's enough for a large percentage particularly obvious but it also has its problems on deployment to production especially is a vector of attack for your production systems because there's a lot of remote code execution uh, exploits using pickle it's not efficient storage it's not compressed data and it's actually very much dependent on the execution environment obviously you're trying to replicate the execution environment but sometimes it might not be uh, feasible so there are, uh, uh, there are other ways of storing models, but it is very much uh, dependent on the, the library that you're using. So it's, it's kind of difficult to, to give you an answer on, on the, 
the best alternative. So let's say imagine you have a PyTorch model. Uh, it's very easy in PyTorch to just save the NumPy arrays. And NumPy arrays have a lot of different model uh, of the weights of the model. And NumPy arrays have very efficient ways to be stored in a compressed manner, for example, using joblib as well. Scikit-learn, you can use joblib as well. Uh, and you can use some, and it has uh, middleware for, for compression. But if you start going into, uh, for example, less supported libraries, even some as something as big as uh, XGBoost, it uh, becomes much more difficult to, to find alternatives that are easy to just plug and play, right? And then it becomes a matter of time spent, uh, invested on doing that versus what you're getting. And sometimes it, it will not be worth it, particularly because you, if you're just running things internally, like so you train the model, it's on your system, theoretically never leaves to the outside system. It is Pickle is not the worst thing if the model is not big. But if you're imagine that uh, you have a, a machine learning system uh, as a service in which you receive pickles from the outside, that is a very big problem if someone is sending you pickles to your system, right? So that's when you need to, to mainly there, uh, concern uh, yourself with pickle storage and about other um, about other ways. However, sorry, just to terminate on this answer, when I mentioned that on my demo, it was not necessarily about using pickle, but actually storing the model just plainly on Git because Git is not made to store uh, binary formats, right? So a couple options there would be uh, to use Git LFS instead of just plain Git. As I explained, it's good to store lar large binary formats or binary formats in general, uh, or simply use some other storage medium and then store just a reference to that storage medium on my Git repository. Uh, and this is even considering that I'm using Git ops. Uh, I, maybe it was not clear, but there are other ML flow processes and cycles that are not as dependent on Git. And you can actually kind of do everything. If you think about it, you can do everything from Neptune uh, because it has the pickle there. It has the tracking of the runs. It has the tracking of the production model. And for example, MLflow even gives you um, that there's a uh, part of MLflow is focused on then serving the models. So you can do the model serving from MLflow and it's kind of all in the same ecosystem. And you, you do not need to store the pickle models in Git. You're just storing the code and you're cross-referencing each other. So you're saying the commits for each pickle that you stored on MLflow, there's the commit for corresponds to this. And you still trigger the CICD pipelines, for example, with Git. But yeah, it's a little bit, uh, there's a lot of like knobs that you can adjust here. OK, so maybe we can end with another question from Luis and then one from me, I think, if we have time. Uh, Luis is asking, I think we all ask <laughs> ourselves this question. There are so many yeah. tools and so many ways of configuring them. How, yeah, how can we avoid getting lost in this valley of tools? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that like the, the question that we would all uh, like to know the answer for everything in life, in fact? That, I mean, um, Look, a very good, like a, a very good, uh, the, the three pillars that I, um, the, the four processes that I mentioned, CSD, tracking, um, continuous monitoring, and data, and I'm liking, uh, and uh, orchestration, sorry. If uh, I, I like to see when I'm doing the process, like integrating something, I like to think that I am checking the box for each one of those. So what I mean is, I in some way have my model runs tracked, in, uh, in some way, my environments are reproducible. In some way, I have a sort of automated uh, testing and deployment process. And in some way, I'm monitoring the model, right? And this is the bare bones that I like to do. And then it then becomes a kind of a struggle uh, of trying uh, from there on, having doing something more is, uh, yeah, it's getting into the territory of a struggle of how much you're expanding versus how much you're actually getting. Because there's a lot of diminishing returns, like in everything in life. There's a lot of diminishing returns once you start doing more and more complex automation. Like sometimes you're a good example of this is you're just sending the score to Neptune, right? And you're checking the score there and you think, well, I can actually send these 20 different plots and these 50 different metrics. And that's gonna take me two weeks of work. And sometimes what happens is that you end up on the summary table comparing by scores anyway, right? So <laughs> the, 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 just the fact that you have a tool available does not necessarily mean that you need to, to employ it or, or everything that I do. As I said, the most important part is trying to find the process and kind of shape it into what you need. And not even, I'm not like a purist. You don't need, purist, purist. You don't need to like to get stuck on every single detail. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, George, again. Uh, my last question is like, if you have any pointers or 
for someone that is just starting, they have worked all their life for, in Jupyter Notebooks, all of their research life anyways. Uh, in Jupyter Notebooks, in Ireland, maybe, I don't know, they don't know exactly what, what to consider, what is most important. If you have any like good resources that you use to learn and that you could share, and we will make them available as well after the, after the recording, that would be great. Yeah, um, I, <laughs> I, I, I really, I actually use a lot of notebooks, mainly for day-to-day -day development. So I, I don't want to anyone that uses a lot of notebooks to feel offended by making fun of notebooks. Although if you probably have like 20,000 executions of a notebook, then I'm kind of going to make fun of you. Uh, but to be honest, it's very much possible. Uh, it's very uh, usable to start Imagine what I did on the training script from Neptune, right? You just add a couple lines that now it's tracked, right? That also works on a notebook. I didn't I use scripts just for easier uh, sharing later, but it also also works on notebooks. So all of these things, I, I would say, just take step by step, add a bit, and then you'll see that you'll you'll understand at which point you still want a bit more of control, or at which point you got to a process that you're satisfied with the automation. Now, one thing that I tell you is when you try a process that is correct, uh, a setup, and a system that is correctly set up. You'll feel that you're, you'll not be kind of able to go back to a system that is disconnected, like that is not correctly set up, because uh, you lose a lot of guarantees and safety when you're working in a system that is correctly uh, tested. On the resources part, one of the resources that I want to share to you that I think I hope it's a good start is the demo. It's a repository; it has everything there. Uh, I did not write a README. I probably just write a README. Um, uh, I'm gonna share it anyway, but then I'm I'm gonna edit a README. And uh, the other, um, the only thing that I'm kind of aware of for MLOps are just a kind of set of uh, courses from a few online free resources. I'll check out if there's anyone, if there's any of those that I feel like is feel sharing, but I'm going to be very honest. I've learned a lot mostly by experience. So I don't really have a, like a set of resources that I used to like uh, kickstart. Kick it was like a do by need and then needs uh, res uh, motivates research and yeah. But I hope the demo can, can help there. Oh, my bad. Uh, yeah, welcome thank you. back. Yeah, at least um, at least you did not leave the call, huh? like someone that I know. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> no, but it went great. Thank you so much again, George, for being here with us. Um, we will share the the links that you are referring to here in the the YouTube description and also in our meetup. Feel free to check our GitHub repository. There will be the slides available, also the link for George's um, demo. Uh, also, there's no problem if you don't have any any um, any readme because they can always refer to this video too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or obviously refer to me, reach out uh, through GitHub, um, through email, we'll be there on the repo or uh, as any other in any other way that you want. Uh, since we're closing, let me just uh, also. Uh, Thank you very much to you guys. Thank you for organizing this initiative. I think it's extremely cool. And I've watched some of the talks already and that uh, they are very interesting. I hope, I don't know, from this side, it's difficult to say. I hope I made something interesting uh, that you guys uh, will enjoy watching and um, enjoyed watching uh, and that you learn also something. Um, thank you very much to everyone who stuck uh, during the whole thing. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Katarina. Yeah. Thank you. It was a really very cool uh, experience to be here and uh, a very cool uh, opportunity as well to present this. Thank you, George. I'm just going to end up with the usual stuff. So, yeah, guys, uh, don't forget to fill out the forms that we, the feedback forms. If there are any topics that you would like to see us discussing in the upcoming sessions, let us know. Also, two weeks from now, we are going to have a very exciting uh, meetup on autonomous driving. And also after that, multimodal AI with Ricardo Souza from Farfetch. Yeah, from Farfetch. And yeah, once again, if you like this talk, please feel free to appear or to go to the uh, MLOps meetup that is happening in person in Saldanha next Tuesday in Portugal from 6 to 8. And um, yeah, thank everyone for participating. Um, and that's all from me. George, do you want to say anything? You You've done a lot yeah. of talking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I've done a lot of talking. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Thank and you so much. See you around.